Hello and welcome to the December um, uh, episode, if you will, or meeting of the Baker Hostetler and Non-Compete and Trade Secrets Practice Group Non-Competes webinar. Um, we appreciate your joining. My name is John Siegel and together with my uh, co-group lead, Joyce Ackerbaum Cox, we're uh, convening this monthly six month long program on the changing world for non-competes and trade secrets across the United States. Today's um, topic is probably the most current and the most uh, uh, rapidly changing area, which is changes in state legislation governing non-competes. As you'll hear, since the adoption of the Defend Trade Secrets Act in 2016, uh, over a dozen states have passed statutes regulating the use of non-competes. And as you'll hear, this is an area where there's a real regionalization of law and economy uh, with great variations between states and even between uh, regions and uh, is really a classic uh, current version of what Justice Brandeis referred to as the states being the laboratories of democracy where uh, legislative and regulated regulation changes are being tried out on the state level. And we'll see over time the impact of those changes on the law and on the economy. We have um, three of our non-compete lawyers uh, today uh, with us. Mark Antonetti, Charday Charlemagne, and Sabrina Shadi, who will each speak to uh, legislative changes in particular regions of the country. Starting with Mark, who's an employment uh, litigator and counselor in the Baker Hostetler, Washington, DC um, uh, office. And then we'll continue to Charday, who's gonna speak about Massachusetts and Illinois, and then out to Sabrina in LA, who's gonna cover the entire Pacific Rim, and we're going to do all this in 30 minutes. So buckle up and here we go. Mark, what's going on with non-compete legislation in the mid-Atlantic states? Hi, John. Uh, here in the DMV, which is to say the District of Columbia, Maryland, and Virginia, uh, could be the Department of Motor Vehicles, we have, or at least each jurisdiction has, enthusiastically embraced the idea of limiting non-competes with Maryland and Virginia implementing uh, total bans on non-competes depending on income levels, and DC uh, pursuing fitfully over the course of last year, a near total ban of non-competes regardless of income levels. So let's start with Maryland. What's happening there? Well, Maryland was the state that got us uh, kicked off on this jag of going after non-competes in the region. Uh, and they uh, did that on October 1st, uh, 2019, with the implementation of a ban on non-compete uh, being used with low-wage workers. In Maryland, uh, non-competes can be used with employees who cannot, cannot be used with employees who earn less than $15 an hour or less than $31,200 per year. So one of the things we're going to do as we travel across the country is look at the common elements of these statutes and then uh, the particular quirks in each jurisdiction. Are there any quirks about the Maryland law that uh, people should know about? Yeah, most significantly, uh, the Maryland law applies retroactively and it renders non-competes that violate the law null and void as being against the public policy of the state. Additionally, the Maryland statute applies whether or not the employer and employee entered into the employment contract or a similar document or agreement in the state. Uh, thus, you can see by using the words null and void that there is a strong public policy uh, provision in the statute against the non-competes being used with low-wage workers. And that was probably in reaction to the, the well-known Jimmy John's case that's out there. Uh, and the other part of it that's significant there is that it, it addresses whether or not the employee and the employer entered into the contract within the state of Maryland. Uh, that means that a contract entered into outside of the state of Maryland also can run afoul of this Maryland provision. So if you're an employer, let's say in West Virginia, 
and somebody comes across the Potomac River and is now working in Maryland and you're attempting to enforce your non-compete against them, uh, that, that could be an issue. And Maryland might say, even if you choose West Virginia law to govern your non-compete, given the strong public policy of the law in Maryland, it might not enforce that even with your choice of law clause, given that strong public policy. Mark, does the Maryland law restrict agreements with respect to other employer uh, proprietary or property interests, such as a client list or the other kinds of things that, you know, a lot of right. us have tried to use non-competes to uh, protect against? No, it doesn't. And in fact, the statute itself specifically carves out uh, those those kind of confidentiality clauses as something that is still potentially valid in Maryland. And I think what you're going to hear today across the program is that you can't just use a cookie cutter agreement. You're going to have to look at each state's specific laws. Right. So, OK, let's cross over now to Virginia. What's happening there? Well, Virginia and Maryland have traditionally been uh, competitors in sports. And when Maryland was still a member of the ACC, it always would battle Virginia as its main opponent. And in fact, Maryland will be playing up in your neck of the woods, woods John, in the pinstripe bowl, Virginia Tech. Uh, in the interest of full disclosure, I live in Maryland and two of my children have either gone or are going there now. So go Terps, beat the Hokies. Um, uh, but Virginia wasn't going to be outdone by Maryland. And the year after the Maryland statute came out, uh, Virginia in 2020 implemented uh, a similar ban based on wage levels, but it's more expansive uh, and uh, sets the wage level, level a lot higher. What is the Virginia wage level threshold in the statute for prohibiting lower income non-competes? Well, I'll read to you what the statute says. The Virginia law says, no employer shall enter into, enforce, or threaten to enforce a covenant not to compete with any low-wage employee, but it doesn't quite say what the low-wage number is. Instead, what they do, and it's a different concept than Maryland, they don't use a fixed number. Instead, they say low-wage employee means an employee whose average weekly earnings calculated divide by dividing the employee's earnings during the 52 weeks immediately preceding the date of termination of employment by 52, or if the employer worked fewer than 52 weeks by the number of weeks the employee was actually paid during the 52-week period, are less than the average weekly wage of the Commonwealth as determined pursuant to subsection B of section 65.2-500. So that's the answer to your question specifically, John. Yeah, so I'm not sure that any employee or probably even almost any employer who's not an accountant could understand that. Can, can you translate that so the people that we're teaching here who are in business can figure out what the heck they should do? Right. Completely impractical is the answer that the Virginia statute provides. So you have to actually do a little bit of digging. And that does involve going on to the different websites and the target constantly changes because every year they recalculate what the average weekly wage is in Virginia. So for this year, uh, the number is actually quite high because Virginia's actually got very high wage earners here in the northern part of the, in the northern part of the state. Um, it's a $1,195 per week, which comes to $62,140 per year for the year 2021. And Virginia actually puts together a little notice, and you can find it on their website, and you're supposed to actually post this thing that talks about how you can figure out what the low wage earner is making. And on one of the websites, you can then get what the average weekly wage is for Virginia uh, in, in that particular year. So it's a moving target and it's a pretty high number for a, what is otherwise called a low wage worker. Does the Virginia law apply retroactively? Now that's one of the ways in which the Virginia law is better than the Maryland law. Uh, it is uh, proactive in approach so that it applies to contracts that are entered into on or after July 1st, 2020. So if you have an existing agreement that existed before July 1, 2020, uh, you should be okay. But you wouldn't be able to discern this from the statute. The only place you see that uh, fact about retroactivity is in the legislative history. Uh, and you have to look at what it was actually passed as. There's a little footnote there, and it, that's where you get that it's only prospective in scope. Are there other requirements that employers should know about? 
in Virginia. Right. As I, I mentioned earlier, there are some posting requirements uh, about the law, and employers can't retaliate against employees under the law. What, what does that mean? I mean, can employees bring a private right of action for violations of this law? Yes, they can. Uh, and they have two years to do it. And there are four different time periods that the statute of limitations can run from. And it is the latter of whatever one of those uh, would apply. Um, and there are, in addition to the private right of action, uh, there are civil penalties available to the Commission of Labor in Virginia, which include $10,000 for each violation of the law. And if you don't make the posting, there are additional penalties that are, are lower, but for failing to make the required posting. So there can be actually quite high consequences to violating the Virginia law. So this all seems pretty complicated and, and pretty rough to figure out. Is there anything else that people should know uh, about Virginia? Yes. Well, first off, given that there are civil penalties in the act, uh, you know, you might infer from that again that Virginia might not honor a choice of law clause, given the strong public policy in the state as reflected by that $10,000 per violation penalty. Um, but even leaving the statute aside, Virginia was already a hard place to enforce a non-compete agreement. So for even those contracts that you have that are more than the 62 or $63,000, let's say, per year, uh, you know, you, you have the potential with judicial decisions eviscerating uh, both the blue pencil rule, you don't get the blue pencil rule in Virginia, so the court's not going to help you out by correcting what the non-compete says. Um, there has even been some decisions which suggest that if you have a blue pencil provision in the contract, that might itself make it unenforceable, some controversy around that. Um, but that it was already difficult to enforce the non-compete in Virginia because if you make it too broad, like you say, you can't work with our competitor, the Virginia court might strike that down because they'll, they'll say, well, are you saying that this lawyer can't go work as a janitor for the competitor? Well, Virginia is not going to enforce that. You know, if you, it has to be like a similar job that you're banning that non-compete for. Um, so, uh, you know, the only other thing I might add is that like the Maryland law, the Virginia law has the saving grace of protecting non-disclosure agreements that protect against the disclosure of trade secrets, confidential information, and the like. You know, I'd rather be in Maryland than Virginia, but uh, between the two, I regard this region as potentially a good environment for uh, pirate to, to pirate employees from your competitors. So what about the state law in the District of Columbia? Um, yeah. Revealing my bias there on that issue, but um, uh, does DC offer a safe haven for employers or how does it treat these issues at this point? Right. Well, John, you're completely right. Taxation without representation and here in the district is wrong. You know, we, we were waiting to get our representation too. But uh, for now, DC is a safe haven in that it has uh, a statute that is not yet in effect. Uh, DC this past year uh, looked to implement what would though be the strongest perhaps non-compete ban in the country. Uh, and earlier this year, we were set to have a total ban on non-competes except for some very, very limited carve out with some addition, additional aggressive uh, provisions in it that we're gonna talk about. Um, Business interests got a little bit upset, I think, with this. Often the D.C. City Council does things under the radar, and then all of a sudden a new law is on the books, and then people are worried about what it means. So there, the, the date for its effective date is has been pushed back to April 1st of 2022. So there are a few months left in which you could still have the non-competes because it's generally regarded the D.C. law won't be retroactive. So when it does go into effect, if and when, are there other requirements under the DC ordinance that folks should know about? Yes, uh, a number of them. First off, uh, there is a carve out for medical professionals, medical specialists, if they make more than a quarter of a million dollars a year. That's one. Two, uh, employers must provide a notice about the DC law within 90 days of the statute becoming applicable, within seven days of an employee joining the company, and within 14 days of an employee requesting to receive 
a notice. So, you know, if the, when an employee starts, you're supposed to hand them something that talks about the DC non-compete law. They actually have specific language in the statute and you need to do that. The place where an employer might get tripped up in April is that they forget that they need to do this within 90 days of implementing it. Uh, and, and so, you know, this is something got to gear up for, for April 1st is to hand out these notices to all your employees. And what happens if you're an employer and you don't do that? Well, there is a civil penalty uh, and, uh, you know, it ranges between $350 and $1,000 per violation. And there are higher uh, amounts that are out there uh, in retaliation cases like Virginia. D.C. has an anti-retaliation uh, provision in the statute. Are there any other quirks about the D.C. law prospectively that people should be on people's radar screens? Yeah, and, and this is a big one that people you know, might not expect, and it may be this provision that stirred up the most controversy. Um, under D.C. law, there is a moonlighting provision. Now, you, you might know what a moonlighting provision is. It's you know, where you forbid people from working for other employers when they're working for you. Uh, under the D.C. law as written, no employer may have a workplace policy that prohibits an employee from one, being employed by another person, two, performing work or providing services for pay for another person, or three, operating the employee's own business. Thus, an employee could work both for you and your competitor at the same time under this provision. Uh, you know, employers who have offices in DC, and many companies do, need to check their handbook. This is another example where cookie cutters just don't work and see what their policies say about uh, moonlighting. And if they have an anti-moonlighting pol policy in it, they probably need to carve that out for DC. So as we're seeing, this stuff is complicated state by state and fair warning, we're probably gonna go over the half an hour just to run through all these states, but we wanna try to cover everything and do it quickly. You mentioned a couple of times about the possibility of the statute being modified uh, or not taking effect until next April. What, what does that mean? What is the situation? And is it a done deal or, or, or what? Right. Well, the city council, uh, you know, probably will be holding some additional hearings on this. And, um, you know, the business interests have put some pressure, especially on the moonlighting provision to make it such that there's a conflicts of interest type of carve out on that. So, you know, you won't have one law firm employing, say, a, a legal secretary during the daytime hours, and then they go across the street in the evening and work for another law firm. I mean, that that creates problems from conflicts perspective and otherwise. So th there will probably be something like that. I would anticipate, though, that the full on ban will stay in effect, but the moonlighting clause might change. In short, stay away from this area if you want to enforce and not compete. All right, let's head northeast. And Joyce, you want to take it up from there? Sure. And I think, Mark, just from the few examples that you gave in the three localities you discussed, it really reinforces what we're going to continue to hear, which is every state, not only can we not do cookie cutter, but every state is going to have to be individualized uh, with respect to these agreements, and it's going to bleed over into employer handbooks and other policies and procedures. So um, I'll pick it up here, and I'd like to turn to you, Charmaine, to talk about um, Massachusetts. Let's start there. And how does that law, um, how is it similar or different in any way to the laws that Mark just discussed in uh, the DMV area? Yeah, so Massachusetts has also taken steps to limit non-competes. However, unlike Maryland or Virginia, they have not implemented a wage-based non-competition ban. Um, instead, Massachusetts, Massachusetts has a comprehensive statute that provides for very specific requirements for valid and enforceable non-competes. Um, that statute is the Massachusetts Non-Competition Act, the MNCA. It applies to all non-competes entered into on or after October 1st, 2018. Um, given our limited time, I'm only going to provide a high-level overview of some of the important, important um, key requirements under this statute. Um, and first, we're going to start with under the MNCA, if um, a non-compete is entered into at the start of an employee's employment, the non-compete must be in writing, it must be signed, and it must expressly state that the employee has the right to consult with counsel prior to signing the agreement. 
if the non-compete is entered into after the commencement of employment, um, consideration is required. It still has to be in writing. It still has to be signed. It still has to expressly state that the individual, um, the employee has the right to consult with counsel. However, there is a consideration requirement. Um, the consideration must be fair and reasonable, and it must be independent from the continuation of employment. So I, I guess the, the sense, the thought is that after you've already started working, um, you need a separate form of consideration outside of the continuation of your employment. Whereas if you enter into the non-compete prior um, to starting your work, that is considered the consideration. Um, previous requirements that non-competes be no broader than necessary to protect the legitimate interest, that still applies. Um, non-competes still must be reasonable in scope and geographic reach, that still is applicable. Um, and importantly, non-competes cannot be longer than 12 months. There are some exceptions um, for employee breaches. If an employee breaches a fiduciary duty or if the employee has unlawfully taken some physical or electronic property of the employer, the non-compete um, restricted period can be extended by an additional 12 months. So it can go up to two years. Um, however, generally non-competes cannot be longer than 12 months. And 12 months is a pretty short period of time, certainly shorter than a lot of our other states, including the one that I sit in in Florida, have um, on the books. Um, and I think it's very interesting, certainly, uh, that you have to set forth a requirement that counsel uh, needs to be consulted prior to signing. It also has some very interesting carve outs with respect to categories of employees. Can you talk about um, who can be subject to non-competes in Massachusetts under this law? Yes. Um, the MNCA bans non-competes entirely as to non-exempt employees under the FLSA. Um, students who are interning while they are in school cannot fall under the non-competes, cannot be subject to a non-compete. Employees aged 18 or younger are not subject to non-competes. And employees that are laid off um, or otherwise terminated without cause cannot be subject to non-competes. Okay, what other um, interesting, as John used the word, quirks uh, or things should we know about under uh, the NCA? Yeah, similar to what Mark mentioned, um, employers cannot avoid limitations with choice of law provisions specifically in the MNCA. So um, an employer cannot just enter a choice of law provision saying another state's law applies. Um, if the employee has been a resident of 30 days at the time of termination. Um, additionally, going back to the consideration point, non-competes must be supported by either a garden leave clause or other mutually agreed upon consideration. The garden leave clause essentially provides a guaranteed payment throughout the restricted period for at, of at least 50% of an employee's average base salary in the last two years that they were employed. So there is some form of consideration, either it's coming in the garden leave clause, which is ensuring that during the restricted period, the employee is still receiving at least 50% of their average base salary, or there has to be some other mutually agreed upon consideration. The interesting thing with the other agreed upon consideration, mutually agreed upon consideration, it's undefined by the statute. It hasn't been interpreted by any of the case law yet. And so it's unclear what would be considered sufficient to um, sufficiently mutually agreed upon consideration. Um, there is a question as to whether or not the garden leave clause, which requires a 50% um, which guarantees a 50% payment throughout the restricted period, it's questionable whether or not that 50% is the baseline that's required for all consideration um, when, whenever you enter a non-compete and whether or not the other mutually agreed upon consideration thus has to meet that 50% threshold or if the other agreed upon um, consideration can be something less than 50%, it's unclear. Um, the statute doesn't define it and the case law hasn't um, hasn't had a chance to, the courts haven't had a chance to go at it yet. So that's gonna be an interesting area to explore in the future. Additionally, um, non-competes um, under the MNCA, they include forfeiture for competition agreements. So forfeiture for non for competition agreements um, basically just impose any adverse financial consequences on a former employee if the employee goes and works for a competitor. So those are covered under the statute. 
but the statute does not include non-solicitation agreements or non-competition non agreements made in connection with a, a sale of business or an entity. Um, the statute also does not apply to agreements made outside of an employment relationship. Um, it doesn't apply to confidentiality or invention assignment agreements. Um, and it also does not apply to non-competition agreements entered into as part of a separation agreement from employment. However, the employee does have seven days to revoke acceptance in that instance. So those are some of the interesting agreements that it, are not included under the statute. I think the fact that non-solicitation agreements are excluded um, is interesting because they're treated differently. Um, and I think that the issue of how the consideration piece is going to work out is also going to be very interesting. And you mentioned about the garden leaf. Um, we're seeing that definitely as a trend uh, in terms of different things that uh, employers are adding to kind of lessen the burden. I think that that's one of the kind of more national trends that we're seeing, but more remains to be seen on that. Um, just so everybody knows, we're going to continue on with our time because we've got some other important things. If we, if you need to drop off, because we did say it's 30 minutes, um, this is going to be recorded and you'll be able to get it via podcast, um, which I will mention at the end. So if you need to drop off now, um, certainly, um, please feel free to log back on uh, via podcast and listen to the rest of it. But let's move on. If we could, Charday, let's move on to Illinois. Um, have they similarly jumped on the bandwagon in terms of putting in significant restrictions like Massachusetts? Yeah, so Illinois is interesting. I think it has taken parts of Massachusetts structure, but also parts of like the Maryland and Virginia structure. Um, so in Illinois, there's a, the Illinois Freedom to Work Act. So this act was originally passed in 2017 and it was very simple, a very narrow statute that was basically a wage-based non-competition ban. Um, it basically just um, restricted the use of non-competes with low wage workers. There have since been edits to the statute, it's been amended, um, and it's going to come into play January of this upcoming year. Um, the new statute or the amended statute will be much more expansive. They've taken out the restrictions with regards to low wage earners and have just applied it to you know, employees across the board. And they've set certain, um, certain income thresholds for the ban. So currently with the new statute, employers are prohibited from entering non-competes with employees earning less than 75,000 annually. The earnings include the salaries, bonuses, commissions, and any other form of taxable compensation. And the threshold is set to increase um, to 80,000 on in January of 2027, and then every five years thereafter um, through 2037. The statute also adds a disclosure requirement and consideration period for employees. So like Massachusetts, they must advise employees in writing that they have the right to consult with counsel prior to signing. Um, but additionally, the employees must be given 14 days to review the agreement prior to signing. Um, a non-compete under this statute is illegal unless the employee receives adequate consideration the covenant is ancillary to a valid employment relationship. The covenant is no greater than is required for the protection of a legitimate business interest. The covenant does not impose undue hardships on the employee and the covenant is not injurious to the public. So similar to Massachusetts, there's some of these um, factors that we've seen before in the case law in terms of the scope and the non-compete not being overly broad and being related to a legitimate business interest. And similar to Massachusetts, we have this adequate consideration factor, again, that's included in Illinois. Um, the statute attempts to define adequate consideration. Adequate consideration is defined as at least two years of continued employment after the agreement is signed or another form of consideration sufficient to support a non-compete. Again, when you get to this phrase regarding another form of consideration sufficient to support a non-compete, it's undefined. Um, and so it has that similar um, question mark as Massachusetts in terms of what will be considered sufficient in the future. It's, it's not entirely clear. The statute also specifically gives the Illinois Attorney General enforcement powers for civil penalties. So the Attorney General can investigate any employer it believes is engaged in a pattern or practice prohibited by the act. 
um, the attorney general can request that the court impose civil penalties of 5,000 for each violation or 10,000 for each repeat violation within a five-year period. Um, Unlike Massachusetts, Illinois specifically limits the use of non-solicitation agreements as well under their statute. So it's similarly, Illinois similarly applies an income threshold requirement for non-solicitation uh, uh, restrictions. Um, non-solicitation restrictions are prohibited for employees who earn less than 45,000 a year and scales up similar to with regards to non-competition agreements. It scales up to 47,500 in the year 2027 um, and then increases again every five years thereafter. Um, the last interesting thing about the Illinois statute is it's coming into play in January. It hasn't quite um, been applied yet, but it also includes a COVID clause, which basically says you can't have a non-compete and a non-compete is unenforceable if um, it's against an employee who was terminated or furloughed or laid off as a result of um, COVID-19 or sim circumstances similar to COVID-19. So. Well, that's interesting. And again, um, a lot of different highlights and things for employers to consider. Um, okay, well, we're going to move out west to our partner, Sabrina Shadi, who's sitting in LA to kind of talk about the variety of states, California, Nevada, Oregon, and, and Washington. Sabrina, do you want to uh, pick up here with John? John, you're on mute. Sorry about that. I just wanted to add in response to a question that someone posted. We're talking here by and large about employment-based non-competes. Uh, non-competes in the case of a sale of business are going to be in almost every state subjected to different rules. Um, and, and so if you're dealing with a, a non-compete ancillary to sale of business, you need to look specifically at the state law that governs. Um, and generally are not going to be affected by these regulations and, uh, and limitations that we're discussing. Now, Sabrina, you know, we typically haven't included you in these non-compete discussions because you practice in California, but we might as well start in California uh, before we take the tour of the Pacific Rim. Um, <laughs> you know, at a high level, what do you need people to know about California starting out? Sure. You know, it, it is a place that most employers do hold near and dear to their hearts. Um, absolutely. And not surprisingly, our non-compete laws are the most extreme. Uh, the basic law here is that non-competes are banned, except in a very narrow set of circumstances, which to the point you were just making tied to the sale of a business. So we do have this narrow exception. If someone is selling the goodwill of a business or all of their ownership in the in, in, in a business, then you know, we have this idea that if you are a buyer of the business, you don't want the person you just purchased from to set up shop in your backyard and start competing against you. So we do recognize that narrow exception. Um, the idea is that you should get the benefit of your bargain. As you may imagine, we do see disputes regarding how much of an ownership interest is enough and whether goodwill was tied to the sale. And so with you know, employees who sometimes just have some level of stock ownership, but it's not necessarily significant enough to also be have the goodwill associated with it, that's where we tend to see um, disputes and, and litigation uh, over uh, whether or not that non-compete can be enforced, even though it was purportedly associated with the sale of an ownership interest in the business. Um, a lot of employers have tried to get around California law with choice of law and venue provisions, and historically our courts would just not uh, apply the out of state choice of law or venue uh, provisions. Um, if you if you ended up in a California court, we had a lot of you know race to the to the courthouse situations. Um, it's considered to be such a strong public policy consideration. Uh, that those choice of law provisions for an out of state choice of law were being ignored. And so eventually the legislature took matters into its own hands, um, as it is prone to do here in California. And as of January of 2017, 
Um, an employer cannot require an employee to sign an employment agreement uh, that requires out of state choice of law or venue, with the exception being that um, if you have your own individual counsel who is uh, advising you on that agreement with those provisions, then you can. So you're really looking at a narrow group of people, probably high level executives who um, have counsel of their own helping them negotiate employment agreements if they'll be working here in the state. Um, Another thing I think for people to know, which I, I realize that sometimes people don't realize, is that California courts also consider a covenant not to solicit a customer essentially the same as a non-compete. And so those are considered unenforceable here as well. Um, covenants not to solicit employees in employment agreements um, historically were considered to be enforceable. And we're starting to see a little bit of change in that area. And we do have some courts that are also refusing to enforce those under the same concept, essentially that they feel that it is a form of, of anti-competitive uh, activity um, in the labor market, essentially. So um, you really have to be careful um, with a non-solicit of, of employees. Now you shouldn't assume it will get enforced. It will really depend on the court and the circumstances. Um, great, uh, it's very helpful. So crossing over the high Sierras, what's happening in Nevada? So in Nevada, you know, you have a place where it's very clear um, who's lobbying and who's getting what they want in the in the legislation. If you hear some dice rolling and uh, cards being uh, shuffled, I, that'll be a, a clue to you uh, who's making things happen in Nevada. Um, it, it is a state historically that has allowed non-competes and applied reasonableness type standards that you know we're used to seeing in other states that allow non-competes. Um, there is a prohibition though historically on restricting a former employee from providing services to a former customer or client if the employee did not solicit the former customers or clients. And of course, if the customers and clients voluntarily choose to leave one business to go to another, and if the former employee generally complies with other provisions in the non-competition covenant. Um, also, uh, similar to um, what we heard with some other states, if an employer terminates an employee due to uh, a workforce reduction, a reorg, some other type of similar restructuring, then a non-competition agreement would only be enforceable during the time where you have a salary continuation, uh, severance payment, et cetera. So when those uh, separation related payments are done, then you don't have the, the enforceable non-compete and the, the involuntary term that happens under those circumstances. However, um, effective October 1 of this year, uh, pursuant to a bill AB 47, a non-compete agreement can no longer apply to an employee who is paid solely on an hourly wage basis, exclusive of any tips or gratuities. So I wonder who pushed that one through. Um, in addition, uh, employers uh, under the new uh, recently amended law may not file an action to restrict a former employee from working for a prior customer or client. Again, if the employee did not solicit former customers or clients, the customers and clients voluntarily chose to leave, and the former employee generally is complying with other terms of the non-competition covenant. Under the new law also, employees can now recover attorney's fees and costs if they challenge a non-competition covenant or if the employer seeks to enforce one against them that's prohibited by the current law. Okay, what about Oregon? So Oregon's laws um, kind of look and feel a little bit more like some of the laws we heard about on the other side of the, the country that Mark spoke about. So, um, and they've had some recent legislation in Oregon to update. So the current statute um, provides that a non-competition agreement is voidable, and this is important because it's where part of the change is tied to. So currently it's voidable and may not be enforced by a court unless the employer advises the employee in a written employment offer at least two weeks before the first day of employment that a non-competition agreement is required 
or if it's um, signed upon a bona fide advancement, a promotion by the uh, employer. If the employee is exempt from minimum wage and overtime laws. So again, we're looking a little bit like the way Illinois was um, in terms of pr protecting those lower wage earners, those hourly um, earners, they can't be held to uh, a non-compete. Um, if the employer has a protectable interest, such as when an employee has access to trade secrets or competitively sensitive confidential information, so they want to make sure you're really limiting it to people who do have the potential to, to actively compete with you because of what they know, what they've had access to. Also, the employee has to make more than the median family income for a family of four is determined by the U.S. Census Bureau. The duration of the non-compete couldn't exceed 18 months, and the employer has to provide a signed written copy of the non-competition agreement to the employee within 30 days after the termination of employment, um, if that's the context that's being provided. Earlier this year, Oregon passed Senate Bill 169, and that's effective as to agreements that are signed on or after this coming January 1st. So it reduces the maximum length of a post-term termination uh, non-compete to 12 months. So it went from 18 to 12 as of January 1. And with limited exceptions, it requires that the employee subject to the non-compete has to be earning at least $100,533. So essentially, you know that the person has to be making at least six figures is an easy way to think about it. Um, and this rate will be adjusted annually for inflation, which is something you know, we see in other states as well. I'll just note finally that the statute does not apply to a covenant not to solicit employees or to solicit or transact business with customers. So let me just note two things. One, uh, we do have a bunch of questions and uh, we're going to, if we're not, if we're not answering those questions during the webinar itself, we'll follow up with offline with people who posted them. Secondly, I don't want to imply that we're comprehensively covering every state that has a new statute. For instance, we're not covering Hawaii, although we're certainly glad to go there for you. Um, but, um, you know, this is a sampling of the states that have new statutes. And then, of course, there are there are uh, states like Florida, Georgia that, you know, have had prior prior, you know, statutes enacted previously where there are also very specific statutory um, um, uh, regulations. But at least last for today's tour, uh, Sabrina, can you talk about Washington and what people need to know about non-competes in the state of Washington? You bet. And you're going to see similar trends here in Washington, as we've heard in other parts of the country, particularly with income-based uh, restrictions. So, you know, Washington, which often follows California's lead on employment laws, does limit non-competes, but I think takes a somewhat more reasonable uh, approach. Um, so a non-compete in Washington can only bind a Washington employee who earns more than thresholds that are established by the statute and those are adjusted by inflation. This year, that amount is $101,390. And it will go up uh, for 2022 to 107, uh, 301 and change. So uh, a little over $107,000 for 2022. Um, one way in which Washington is similar to California, though, is that a provision in a non compete agreement signed by a Washington based employee is void and unenforceable when it requires an out of state choice of venue or choice of law. Um, Washington state also just has a few other additional interesting provisions that I thought were worth noting. Um, franchisors, um, they cannot prevent franchisees from hiring employees of the franchisor or other franchisees of the same franchisor. Um, so that's a, an interesting twist um, in the state of Washington. Um, employers are also generally not to permitted to prohibit employees who are earning less than twice the state minimum wage from having additional employment. I know Mark had speak, spoken about this moonlighting um, provision. So, um, the, so you cannot keep someone you know, based on their income potentially from working for um, another employer 
um, unless you can show that the services that the employee is going to perform raise safety issues or interfere with the reasonable and, uh, and normal scheduling expectations of the employer. Well, all of that is enough to make mine and I'm sure everyone else's head spin. I'm glad a lot of you uh, um, stayed with us through the conclusion of the program. I think what is very clear is that national uh, or international employers are gonna have a lot of work to do to either amend agreements uh, individualize them per state, make a choice to keep a national agreement with an understanding that it's not going to be enforceable in many different locations or try to parse out into particular regions where they're able, but there's a lot of different considerations that go into, um, into place here. Certainly one size does not fit all. Um, as we wrap up, we want to say thank you to each of our excellent panelists. I think that uh, in the short short period of time, they covered some very, very important information. So Mark Chardet and Sabrina, thank you. Uh, we also want to remind you that the fifth of our six part series is going to be coming up in January. It's the second Wednesday of the month. I think that's January 12th at 1 p.m. Eastern. Again, it's scheduled for 30 minutes. We hope to stay on time. The subject matter of that will be it's the title is nationalizing competitiveness and non compete law criminal antitrust and federal efforts to curtail no poach and non-compete agreements. And you're gonna be hearing from some of our excellent partners in our antitrust group who all of us have been working with a lot over the last year or two because the Department of Justice has really kicked up efforts, not just from a civil perspective, but from a frighteningly uh, criminal perspective with respect to uh, businesses that have some of these no hire, no poach, uh, different agreements um, that we've seen in place. And so uh, I think you will find that very eye-opening. Um, and as I said, quite scary because of the potential implications for that. So we ask you to join us uh, for that on January 12th. And then the final in this kind of six part series will be on February 9th. Uh, we'll kind of try to wrap up a lot of what we heard, talk about um, a, more of a shift on trade secrets when you know, your non-competes are completely null and void based on all these new state laws and various regulations. Um, the last thing I will say is that um, I mentioned it before, all of these are recorded. You can get the podcast and also CLE is available uh, as you listen to this only live, unfortunately not podcast. Uh, so you will be getting a survey and you can respond to the extent that you need CLE credit. Uh, so we thank you for joining us today. Thank you for sticking around and indulging us, even though we went 20 minutes over. Um, but we think that this was an important topic area that warranted a little bit more time. So have a great day, everyone. We hope to see you on January 12th. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Thank you.